All right, we are live. Good, I'll say good afternoon. I, I have a minute. It's still morning for me at 11.59 Eastern, but uh, maybe it's good morning for you. Maybe it's good afternoon. Maybe it's the middle of the night because uh, as Justine and I know all too well, we have people that log in from all over the world. And so wherever you are logging in from today, welcome. Excited to have you. And many of you do know we always love, and I'm turning on my chat feed right now, and you guys are awesome. You, many of our, our, our um, return friends here uh, know, the, know the drill. They're already typing in where they're logging in from, from around the country or around the world. So if this is your first event or you're, you're remembering now, please go ahead and type in where you are logging in from today. I am logging in from a beautiful, sunny uh, Pennsylvania just outside of Philadelphia as I look out my window above my monitor. Um, not a cloud in the sky, so I'm logging in from just outside of Philadelphia. Justine, what about you? I am logged in from St. Paul, Minnesota, where it is a hot and humid uh, 90 degrees today, but sunny and beautiful. And I'm looking through our screener over here. We have Florida, Oregon, uh, let's see, Virginia, uh, Minnesota, Houston, Wisconsin. We have Greece, Bjorn, I think, if I'm pronouncing that right, from Greece. Welcome. Um, Chelsea from California, let's see, New York, Chile, uh, Jacksonville, Kenya, wow, uh, that's amazing, Qatar, uh, uh, Pakistan, North Carolina, Atlanta, uh, Alberta and Canada, Calgary, so this is really awesome, Justine and I truly love reading um, um, all of your comments and notes of where you're logging in from, because it's not as we say, just the country, the United States, or even North America anymore. We really do enjoy interacting with all of our friends and colleagues from around the world. So please go ahead and continue to type in where you're logging in from. We will absolutely check out all of these later. But being very respectful of your time, we know you're probably having a busy today, day today. We wanted to, to jump right into this awesome session and uh, and you're, you're looking at the speaker. In fact, it is Justine. <laughs> Super excited. Uh, sometimes we're, we're both on together with another speaker, but we're here today to, to listen to uh, amazingly, uh, the amazingly talented Dr. Justine Lee. We're going to be talking about the emergency treatment of leptospirosis. It's more than just doxycycline. So really excited for that to be on our agenda for today. And uh, I did want to give a special shout out to an amazing educational partner, Merck Animal Health. You all do know that when we have the the fortune of an amazing uh, uh, partner, amazing educational partner like Merck Animal Health. We're truly blessed and happy to be providing this completely complimentary, completely free to the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health for being with us today. And, and now let's continue to move forward. Short and abbreviated introduction, because many of you do know VetGirl now. So how do you get your CE certificates? We're giving this live. It's interactive. You can ask questions. And I'm actually going to type into the question screen right now that code right there. So just so you guys know, there are two ways. One is you can use your fancy smartphone, use that camera feature, and hover over that QR code on the right side. It'll bring you right up to the, the uh, form to fill out all of your information to get your CE certificate. If you don't have a fancy smartphone, I just typed into the question screener our URL, the website address, tinyurl.com forward slash VG for Vecrol and today's date, 6 If you type that in, it'll be the same thing that your phone brings you to on the QR code right to that website. You don't have to do it and rush right now. It's 12 o'clock Eastern approximately. We should end around 12.30 Eastern. I'm going to keep it open until 1 Eastern. So you'll have 30 minutes after the session is over to fill it out so you don't miss anything that you want to learn. This is YouTube, so many of you do know it's a small box on many of your screens. All the way in the bottom right, if you hover over that toolbar, that bottom right broken box, if you click on that, it'll become full screen on your desktop so you can see everything even bigger and better. A couple things about Vecrol. As I said, this is an active participation. It's live. It's interactive. There is no quiz. If you are a Vetgirl member and you watch this video after the fact, yes, right underneath, there is a short quiz. But again, if you're watching this as we're giving it live today, right now on the 29th of June, no quiz is needed. We'll email your CE certificate usually within seven days of today. Usually it's sooner, two to three days, but it can take up to seven days for us to verify attendance. So please stay tuned. Again, make sure you fill out that form. If you do within seven days, you'll get it. 
any questions, let us know. If this is your first Vet Girl event, we love to provide education in a multimedia approach. So we do webinars like this, whether they're traditional or shortened like YouTube Live, podcasts, blogs, videos. You can interact with us on the message board. And all the way, even more on the right-hand side, we have great opportunities for our certificate programs. It's really an amazing way to become more proficient in a specific area, whether it's emergency, practice management, feline urinary health, our new release veterinary technician track, ophthalmology, and more. As a Vet Girl member, this is value add part of your Vet Girl membership. I hope you're using it and gaining expertise in that area that you want. And then lastly, I hope you are signing up, if not already, very soon for Vet Girl U 2022. It's going to be back in Minnesota in August of this year. We are almost sold out. So we don't want you to have FOMO, that fear of missing out that everyone worries about. Please, if you're thinking about it, hop on at ASAP, sign up for Vet Girl U. You guys know we treat you right. We wine and dine you amazing swag, backpacks, water bottles, and amazing speakers and TED Talk-like sessions. So don't delay. Sign up. Only a few spots are remaining. With that said, I know you're not here to listen to me today. You're here to listen to Dr. Justine Lee. So Dr. Lee, little background. Most of us know you already, or we should by now, but a little background. And then please, please, please take it away. The floor is going to be yours. All right. Thank you so much, Garrett. Uh, I've been giving a YouTube live forever. So really excited to be here. And thank you uh, for taking a busy uh, clinic half hour to learn with us, whether or not it's in the morning or lunchtime or wherever you are, wherever you are in the world. Um, you guys know me already. So I'll just briefly uh, uh, review. I'm an emergency critical care specialist and toxicologist. And I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vet Girl with Garrett. And uh, just wanted to fully disclose, I have a direct or indirect relationship with Vet Girl, Blue Pearl, and Merck Animal Health, but it will not influence my presentation. And with that, let's go ahead and jump in. So what are we going to talk about today? If you only learn one or two things from this talk today, it's really going to be how to rapidly recognize lepto. And then we're going to focus on the treatment. Believe it or not, it's more than just doxycycline, right? So first of all, recognizing lepto, we want to identify which dog is at, at risk. You guys have heard this before. When I was trained in vet school 20, 20 plus years ago, we were always taught it was that farm dog that was roaming. It wasn't that terrier that was in an urban setting that lived in New York City, whose feet never touched the floor. But interestingly enough, that has completely changed in the past 10, 20 plus years. So which dog is at risk? Well, just in case you fall asleep over lunchtime, it's those dogs that are terriers and less than 10 pounds. And I know that's totally different from what we were taught, but again, reiterates the importance of us keeping up to date on CE and what's current in the veterinary literature. So it's not that farm dog anymore. I mean, it still could be, but now we're seeing a different patient population. Clinical signs. We used to be taught it was that ictric azotemic patient. And actually it's 80% of the time, it's gonna be that acute kidney injury patient. So if you have an azotemic dog, this should be on your top three things for differentials, right? We're going to worry about nephrotoxicants. We're going to worry about infectious diseases like lepto. We're going to worry about underlying acute on chronic renal disease. We're going to focus on treatment during the duration of this talk. It's not just putting them on fluids and starting doxy. There's a lot more that you have to be cognizant of. And we'll also talk about the importance of prevention. All right. So with that, are your canine patients at risk for lepto? I was just in Arizona last week. And as you know, it was super, super hot. It was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There was no lawn anywhere. Um, it was mostly, you know, beautiful rocks and gardens and succulents. But occasionally there'd be huge golf uh, uh, courses or there would be beautiful manicured lawns and even in areas like Phoenix they can have massive outbreaks with lepto. And you're probably thinking, well, that's weird because it's a desert. But remember, it's our love for lawns and sprinklers. So does your canine population drink water, lick grass? Are they a small dog? Do they live in the city? 
did the, the pet owners like their lawn and use sprinklers, then yes, those patient populations are at risk for canine leptospirosis. We used to be taught it was mostly the Northeast or the Pacific Northwest or the head of the Mississippi River. And again, now we're seeing lepto everywhere. So let's jump on to the next slide. And what we're seeing is an increased incidence. Again, it's now more urban settings. It's smaller dogs, less than 10 to 15 pounds. It's the terrier group because their nose is always on that sidewalk smelling. And again, overrepresentation of male dogs. All right, what are we gonna see on clinical signs? Well, it's classically that ADR or ain't doing right dog. So it's gonna be what I classically see in the ER, which is the ADR dog with lethargy, they're not eating, they may be slightly febrile, they may be slightly dehydrated, and that's pretty much the clinical presentation for 100% of the patients that come into the veterinary ER. But I want you to have it on your radar if that patient has PUPD. Now, if you're not asking any coughing, sneezing, vomiting, diarrhea, PUPD, you're not going to be able to identify this. This to me is a classic sign of leptospirosis. To me, it's almost pathognomonic. When you see a PUPD dehydrated patient, that instantly makes me worried. And first of all, you have to be cognizant, it's not just because they're an acute kidney injury. Dogs with leptospirosis that aren't azotemic yet still show signs of PUPD. And it's this weird nephrogenic diabetes insipidus-like syndrome that they get from lepto. So again, that should be on your radar. Are they PUPD? Now, I can say rarely we'll see chronic signs of lepto. It's much less common, but some dogs can have weight loss. So again, we were taught in vet school 20 years ago, hepatic plus renal equal leptospirosis. And again, that's really changed. Now it's renal disease. All right, so going into the next slide, we know 80 to 90% of the time it's gonna be renal disease. So very similar clinical signs, inapidence, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, PUPD, they're gonna be dehydrated. They may have abdominal pain when you go to palpate their kidneys. They may be oliguric or anuric or polyuric, which means you need to know what their normal urine output is. And we'll talk about that later. And rarely, it could be from underlying chronic renal disease. Now, less commonly, 10 to 20% of the time, will it be due to, well, we see a hepatopathy. And usually when you do see a hepatopathy, there's also concurrent azotemia. So again, really similar clinical signs. They're inapidant. They have malaise. They're vomiting. Again, classic presentation to the veterinary ER in general. But they may also have melanoma or icterus, they may be in hepatic failure, or rarely they can have chronic active hepatitis. Some less common clinical signs that we can see, maybe fever, they may show vague signs like shivering or muscle tenderness, not moving. Very rarely, this is mostly a bovine or cow thing where there'll be uveitis or conjunctivitis. And I will say I have occasionally seen what we call LPHS. This is leptospiral pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome. This is usually when I'm referred the lepto case from your clinic. When you see LPHS, that's basically when we're seeing almost like an ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome like symptom from leptospirosis. I've had cases that were being managed on IV fluids and all of a sudden, despite being treated with fluids and doxycycline or some type of penicillin, I will also, I'll be referred these cases because all of a sudden they're becoming tachypnic. You take chest radiographs on them and they have this diffuse alveolar pattern. It could be a really dense interstitial pattern. And all of a sudden you diagnose leptospiral pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome. So that's classically thought to be due to a vasculitis and it does have a poorer prognosis. So just be aware, not very common, but can be seen. Now, what's the prognosis for lepto? I usually quote, based on the literature, that it's going to be about 75 to 80% survival, which is great in the ER. But I will also say that means one out of every, every four or five dog dies or is euthanized from it. So while the prognosis is fair to good, in my clinical experience, it typically takes three to four days of hospitalization in order to treat that. And that's 24-7 hospitalization for continued IV fluid therapy and supportive care. 
And nowadays that costs four to $5,000. Not only is it really expensive, but it's gonna predispose that canine patient to future chronic renal disease, chronic renal inflammation. So the frustrating thing is this one is preventable with vaccine. So while it's treatable as a critic list, I think everything's savable, it can be really expensive and can result in underlying renal injury. Now, let's go through a case. This was a case that I saw a couple years ago, a dog named Mitzi, a four-year-old male castrate Yorkshire Terrier, who is five kings, had a two-day history of ADR and was up to date on vaccines per the pet owner. But when I asked the pet owner, is your dog vaccinated for lepto? They had no idea. The dog was on seasonal preventative, and this dog lives in the Twin Cities in St. Paul, Minnesota, doesn't go to dog parks, only walks um, around the house and in their yard and on the sidewalk. So no major, uh, no major exposure to streams or parks or anything like that. On physical exam, Mitzi's 10% dehydrated. When I look at the third eyelids, they're equivocally icteric, which makes me think the total bilirubin is about two. The dog has moderate pulse quality, CRTs a little bit prolonged, it's exactly two seconds, heart rate's tachycardic even for a small dog at 180 beats per minute. The dog splints on abdominal palpation, and the weird thing is, this dog's dehydrated and has a moderate size bladder. That's great for me, because I want to get a cysto, but as soon as you see a dehydrated dog with a big bladder or a dehydrated cat with a big bladder, you should instantly think something is weird, because if a patient with normal renal values or normal kidney function is dehydrated, they're going to absorb through ADH stimulation every last drop of water to hydrate themselves. So their bladder should be tiny and their bladder, their urine should be super, super concentrated. So as soon as I see that moderate sized bladder, I'm instantly worried that something else is going on. So I get permission. I get a history from the pet owner. We go ahead and place an IV catheter in this dog because I don't love the fact that this dog's heart rate is 180 and the dog only has moderate pulse quality. Now, I love the big four. The big four is the PCV, total solids, blood glucose, and azo. Instantly, within two minutes, for $5 or less, it gives you a wealth of information. We get a PCV of 58%, a total solids of eight, a blood glucose that's slightly higher than normal, and an azo stick that's 50 to 80. It can't read above that. But instantly, I'm like, huh, that's weird. This dog's hemoconcentrated slightly hyperglycemic and appears to be acetemic. And when I look at the hematorca tube, it's slightly ictric. So first thing in my mind, not only is this dog dehydrated, not only is this dog um, acetemic, but this dog's also slightly ictric. I'm instantly thinking about leptospirosis. So we go ahead and get full diagnostics pre-treatment. I pull a complete blood count, a chemistry, a urinalysis, and a urine culture. Now, to quote Dr. Jody Lulich, the nephrologist at University of Minnesota, you got to grow it to know it. So before you start an animal on antibiotics, please make sure to do that urine culture. And ideally, I want to do this before this patient sees any IV fluids. I already am concerned that this dog has acute kidney injury because the azo is elevated. And ideally, we want to get that urine culture, that UA, before this patient sees any kind of therapy. All right. So what do we do next? Well, this dog has signs of dehydration and hypovolemia. Remember, those are two semantically different things. Dehydration is interstitial fluid loss, hypovolemia. This dog's blood vessels are empty right? So this dog has both. So I'm worried. I want to give this dog a fluid bolus. Now, if you only learn a third thing from this lecture, we don't quote the shock dose of fluids anymore. This dog doesn't really need 60 to 90 mils per kg over 20 minutes. So what we've done is we moved to a third of a shock bolus. So smaller aliquots with more frequent reassessment and rebolusing as needed. So I'm going to start this dog on 20 to 30 mils per kg as an IV bolus. This dog is five kg. So I'm going to start with 150 mils of P-Lite 148 or whatever maintenance fluid you want to use over 30 minutes. What do we want to do now? Well, I'm going to get some blood work. And what I see in my blood work is this dog has a leukocytosis, a white count of 18,500. This dog is slightly thrombocytopenic. And if you only learn a fourth thing from this lecture, it's look for that thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia is so common with leptospirosis patients. This to me is a classic pathognomonic sign for leptospirosis. So instantly I see this dog is not low enough to be an ITP, but low enough for it to be red on my blood work, okay, abnormal. We see this dog's hemoconcentrated, and now we get our chemistry findings back. This dog's BUN is 88, 
creatinine's 4.2. Total bilirubin is elevated at 2.6. Dog's liver enzymes, AST, ALT, ALKFOS are all pretty elevated, approximately 800 to 1100. Dog slightly hyperglycemic. And a, the, again, the dog is hyperproteinemic, likely from hemoconcentration. So how are we going to diagnose lepto? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I really want to focus on treatment. But if you learn a fifth thing from this lecture is PCR stands for please can run. Please run a PCR. Okay. The reason why we're taught in vet school to get pre-treatment blood work is because PCR is so affected that it will test falsely negative by just one or two doses of antimicrobial therapy, okay? So we always submit two samples. So a blood sample and a urine sample, that's how we're gonna submit it. One is gonna catch early stage of infection, one is gonna catch late stage. Remember, PCR is not affected by vaccination and thankfully most pet owners understand PCR testing now due to COVID. Now, I'm more of a fan of PCR. It takes a few days to get back, but to me, it's extremely accurate because you're looking for a RNA or DNA. I'm not a huge fan of MAT tests or microscopic agglutination, and that's what most people run. Um, the main reason why is because in my experience, and I'm going to say if I had to generalize greater than 50 to 60% of the time, that first MAT is usually negative. It's not until you get a convalescent titer two to four weeks later that it's actually going to be positive. So again, I prefer a PCR. If you do do a MAT test, please make sure to submit it to the same lab. And you can see on this slide here, this one's a pretty obvious MAT test. And I wish all of mine came back at 1 to 52, 51,200, but they're not usually this obvious. So again, I generally prefer PCR. All right, with that, let's jump right in to Mitzi's treatment. What are we going to do for this dog? All right, so our main state treatment for acute kidney injury is going to be fluid therapy. Do I really care what type of fluids you give? No, I want something with water and sodium. And I usually pick the sodium um, in the bag of fluid that's co closest to my patient's sodium. So I love fluids like uh, P-Lite, Normar, LRS, things like that. Now, I'm also going to say you have a narrow time frame to treat before that injury gets worse. Um, and the cost of hospitalization can be several thousand dollars. But to me, it's not enough just to put these patients on twice maintenance during the day. They need fluid therapy 24 hours a day. And you need to make sure that you're titrating your fluid therapy appropriately. Remember, fluid therapy is never set it and forget it. And so my ultimate goal of monitoring IV fluid rates is I will disclose I'm much more aggressive in the first six hours of hospitalization. And I usually have them on several times maintenance because I've calculated dehydration. I've calculated ongoing losses and I'm adding in maintenance. And we'll go through some numbers in a second. But my ultimate goal is I want this patient hemodilute within typically 12 to 24 hours. I want this patient to be isosinuric while on IV fluids. I want this patient to gain weight. And if there's not a reason or a contraindication for them not to have water, I want them to have water because I want them to be able to drink as long as they're not vomiting or about to be sedated or anything like that. All right, so let's start with monitoring weight first. We know Mitzi came in at five kicks. Well, I estimated Mitzi to be 10 percent dry. So five kigs times 10% or 0.1 times 1000 mils. This dog needs 500 mils just to replace dehydration. Well, thanks to the metric system, 500 mils equals 0 0.5 kigs. This dog better weigh 5.5 kigs by the end of the day. Okay. Or within 12 to 24 hours, depending on how soon you replace that dehydration. Take home messages. You better be weighing this dog two to four to six times a day. Same scale. Main reason why is we want to measure it after we put an IV catheter in. And it's a very easy way for us to be able to assess hydration in that patient. Next part, let's calculate Mitzi's fluid plan. Mitzi's five kicks. I ballpark 60 mils per kick per day for maintenance, which is 300 mils per day or 13 mils an hour. We already calculated Mitzi's dehydration at 500 mils. Well, if I was going to replace that dehydration over 12 hours, that'd be 42 hours. So 500 divided by 12. This dog needs 42 mils an hour plus 13 mils an hour just to meet the maintenance. Plus, we have to add in ongoing losses. So for Mitzi, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, put this dog on 13 plus 42 together. Next slide. 
All right. So Mitzi is going to be on 55 to 60 mils per hour. Again, the maintenance is 13 mils an hour. Dehydration is 42 mils an hour. We're going to assume some ongoing losses. And ultimately, our goals of assessing hydration are going to be hemodilution, weight gain, the presence of drinking water in a cage, that presence of isosinuria. This dog's probably isosinuric already because of acute kidney injury. But again, this dog better weigh 5.5 kgs, ideally in 12 hours which means you need to know the next important thing, urine output. Remember, normal urine output is one to two mils per kg per hour. And you have to be aware, a lot of my leptospirosis patients are actually polyuric. They're making three to four to five to six mils per kg per hour. And if you only have them on twice maintenance, or you think you're being aggressive putting them on three times maintenance, but you're not actually monitoring urine output, you could actually be really behind on fluids. I, be, be, I become concerned when my patient is oliguric at 0.5 to 1 mil per kg per hour. However, before you just say, hmm, this dog's becoming oliguric, let me give it a dose of furosemide, you have to ask yourself, is this dog making less urine because I don't have it on enough fluids or because its kidney disease is getting worse? So do a physical exam. Check another bio and creatinine. Check a urine-specific gravity. Reweigh the dog. Reassess the patient. Is the dog getting overhydrated? So before you reach for furosemide, if that dog is oliguric, ask yourself if this dog actually needs more fluid therapy, and that's why it's not urinating quite as much. Once they're anuric, making less than 0.5 mils per kg per hour of urine, their prognosis is unfortunately much worse, which then means you need to know how to calculate ins and outs. Now, for you veterinarians, this is why you took advanced calculus to get into vet school is to divide by four. Okay. So make sure we're calculating ins and outs. Let's say we have a classic feline urethral obstruction. It urinates 160 mils over four hours. Its urine output is 160 divided by four or 40 mils an hour. Say the dog for uh, the cat for easy math is uh, four kgs. So this cat is peeing 10 mils per kg per hour. If you gave 80 mils an hour IV over the past four hours, or you look at your fluid pump and you see it's at 20 mils an hour. If this cat is urinating 40 mils an hour and you're only giving 20 mils an hour IV, of course your cat's gonna get more dry. What goes in must come out. What goes out must uh, be replaced in. So again, really important that you feel comfortable calculating ins and outs. So let's uh, go back to Mitzi. So we wanna make sure that we're monitoring the physical exam every day, that we're slowly weaning the fluids as the azotemia improves, we're checking that urine output, we're measuring the blood pressure. And if you look at this chart, you can see that Mitzi started at four, a creatinine of 4.2 and 88, was polyuric and making six mils per kg per hour of urine, which is again, uh, approximately three to six times higher than it should be. And this dog came in hemoconcentrated. By the end of day one, I actually decreased this dog to 55 mils an hour because this dog's becoming more hemodilute at a PCV of 45 and seven. And now this dog is gaining appropriate weight. This dog's 5.4 kgs, which is moving in the right direction. By day two, I recheck a, a renal panel and this dog's creatinine is improved to 3.1 and 60. I turn my fluids down just a little bit because now my dog is perfectly hemodilute. PCV is 35. Total solids is five, dog's 5.5 kgs, I'm happy. Continue this dog. On the third day, this dog's creatinine's almost resolved. Creatinine was 1.7, BUN was 32. This dog is actually still very hemodilute, 34 and 4.8. And I turned this dog's fluid rate down to 30 mils an hour. This dog was getting slightly overhydrated. So I titrated this based on the urine output. This dog actually went home on day four and azotemia had resolved. So again, it takes about four days, but again, we do want to make sure that we're treating these guys appropriately by monitoring their urine output, by monitoring their weight gain, by monitoring their PCB and total solids. Next mainstay therapy after fluid therapy is going to be gastrointestinal. Now we know this dog is azotemic. We know this dog, it has a decreased ability to metabolize gastrin because of kidney failure. So it's gonna have higher gastric acid, it's gonna have ga higher gastric ulcers. So I'm gonna put this dog on whatever your favorite antacid is. I like pantoprazole IV. I don't usually start sucrophate until they go home. Um, I like to make sure I have that nausea and that vomiting under control with meropotent. On a little side note, I did wanna point out the ACVM consensus statement on the support for rational administration of gastrointestinal protectants 
to dogs and cats, totally indicated in this dog because this dog's an acute kidney injury. But the gist of this paper is please stop using so many antacids just because as fur doesn't mean it means to go on famotidine. Okay, so great consensus statement you should check out. The gist of it is, again, stop overusing antacids. Long-term use of antacids has been associated with adverse effects in human and veterinary medicine. And we only want to do it when it's judicious, which is warranted with Mitzi because Mitzi is azotemic. I am going to start Mitzi on a phosphate binder uh, because she actually was hyper, he was hyper phosphatemic. I generally, you know, we're all taught you should wait until they're eating. And I'm going to say there's a lot of phosphorus in their gut. So um, sometimes I'll trickle feed these guys uh, through a feeding tube. So if I'm doing that, I will definitely start them on a phosphate binder. Remember, 90% of your phosphorus is absorbed through your gut. 90% is excreted through your kidneys. And we're really trying to prevent that renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. Remember, we're taught in vet school at least in, in the United States, calcium times phosphorus, when it's greater than 70, they start to mineralize. And we're trying to um, decrease that risk of mineralization by treating that hyperphosphatemia. All right, what else are we going to do? Third mainstay therapy. Yes, it is doxycycline, right, for treating the leptospirosis patient. Our goal is to eliminate leptospiremia, to eliminate the organisms from the renal tubular cells in that renal carrier state. So in the hospital, I typically use an IV penicillin. So I usually use IV ampicillin sulbactam. Um, and then once they're um, feeling better, once they're actually eating, I will start them on doxycycline uh, for 14 days. And any dog, that's in that household um, that also has similar environment, I also do recommend a, a veterinary visit, even if they're not symptomatic for treatment. All right, what else did Mitzi get? Appropriate monitoring and supportive care, urine output monitoring, blood pressure monitoring, baseline daily renal panel, uh, PCV total solids and electrolytes once or twice a day for the next few days, appropriate supportive care uh, in terms of nutritional support. And thankfully, most of these patients do well. Ultimately, the prognosis for leptospirosis is fair to good, again, 75 to 80%, but these patients are at risk for chronic renal failure. So we do want to treat them aggressively, and that's why preventative care is so important. There's a really old study about 25 plus years ago where this poor grad student had to trap uh, rats in inner cities. I'm not sure what cities they were, but 90% 90, 90 of the rats trapped were carrying lepto. So again, just be cognizant. Uh, most pet owners don't think their pets are exposed to mice or rats, right? They don't have rats in their yard. They don't have mice in their yard. Um, but those mice and rats are urinating on urban sidewalks, right? So they don't think their pet has rat exposure, but they actually do. Uh, for more information, I did want to direct people to a great resource. Um, the CDC website has great information on lepto. You can go to lepto.com when in doubt. Um, you want to make sure to educate your pet owners appropriately for this because most pet owners aren't aware of that. More importantly, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. If you're in a lepto endemic area or if you live in a city, you're seeing a small dog, less than 15 pounds. Um, those are patients that weren't on our radar before. And those are the patients that are that I see that are coming in with lepto. Um, I'm a big, big believer in more uh, protection. So I like to use four-way. And I will fully disclose my dog, my own personal 10-year-old pit bull is vaccinated annually with four-way because I live at the head of the Mississippi River and we flood every spring and uh, we have really, really bad lepto in Minnesota. So again, really important that we educate our pet owners on preventative care. Uh, remember, it's an annual vaccination, uh, regardless of breed. And remember, most dogs are at risk. It's got a wide margin of safety. And um, most breeders 30 years ago used to say, oh, you know, you can't get your dog lepto vaccinated uh, because the vaccine is hot. Uh, well, that's not true anymore. Uh, these vaccines are ultra filtrated. So just be aware of that. Um, Ideally, we want to use a vaccine that protects against disease and mortality, that prevents shedding of leptospires and urine, because we really want to minimize that zoonotic risk. And again, we really want to protect our canine patients from ever developing acute kidney injury and prevent that zoonotic risk and exposure uh, in our environment. And with that, I wanted to give a huge shout out and thank you to Merck Animal Health for sponsoring this YouTube live and for being able to provide 30 minutes of free CE to you guys during the middle of the day or in the morning, wherever you may be. And with that, I'm going to open up the floor to uh, any questions that are out there. You know, Justine, we uh, do get the common question. Clearly, leptospirosis is something we think about more for our dogs, for our canine patients. But what's the word on 
cats, just because we know we're going to get a couple of those questions. I already yeah. see one in here. Yeah, great question. Um, lepto definitely is has been diagnosed in cats before. Um, you can actually find it. It's peer reviewed. It's published. It's in the literature. It's not common, uh, but there's definitely ep evidence of cats with leptospirosis. Um, it is probably underdiagnosed. How many ADR cats do we see that are uh, azotemic that come in with acute kitty injury um, that uh, may have a history of mousing um, that may be indoor outdoor uh, that we give an injection of you know antimicrobial therapy to, or we put them on antimicrobial therapy. There's no test. Uh, there's no vaccine for cats. But yes, there is definitely a published reports of cats with leptospirosis, probably not super common. Um, but in the literature, the cats that get it are primarily outdoors and um, um, good hunters. Excellent. And we do this is a, a Seth has a question, which I think is, 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 something to talk about in this topic, but I also think something that many people have when you or I or others address fluid therapy in general, because we talk about fluid therapy often at um, the, we'll call it the sick, right? Because they're sick here, but uh, no comorbidity type of patient. And when I say comorbidities to be very specific, it's how do you treat a patient that has in quote heart disease? Are you going to be um, as aggressive? Um, I always tell people there's no formula for the, the degree of heart disease, you know, a stage two out of six, you don't subtract 10 or add four or square root of seven. Like there's no, there's no formula, but how do you Justine address the, the patient that has a heart murmur or some heart disease? Great question. So again, it's really going to be the parameters that I talked about. So it's going to be um, weighing them frequently. It's going to be doing your frequent uh, physical examinations. It's going to be assessing their uh, PCV total solids, um, looking for hemodilution, giving them a bowl of water. I will say in that situation, I'm going to use um, a lower sodium fluid. So potentially half strength saline plus 2.5% dextrose. The dextrose is not in there because it's they're hypoglycemic. It's in there to make it an isoosmolar fluid because half strength saline is only 154 milliosmoles. So when in doubt, um, if it's a significant heart murmur, um, I will move them to a different fluid choice with less sodium. Um, and I put them on a respirate every two hours. Um, so I do watch them like a hawk. I would also replace my dehydration over 24 hours instead of 12 hours. Um, and so those are the biggest primers that I would use. It's between a rock and a hard place, but you do need to treat them, um, especially if you are concerned about um, acute kidney injury. And, and I'll add the importance of, and Justine mentioned this in her lecture, weighing patients. Um, weighing patients is a $0 test or tool that you can use to decide um, how you're doing in your fluid therapy. Are they gaining too much weight too fast? Are they losing weight? So hopefully before we get to the point where they're in fluid overload and for our canines respiratory to stress as a result in their heart, um, we can get a couple of clinical tips because it's really hard. There's not one tool or one examination finding to say, are they becoming fluid overloaded or not? It's really, as Justine was talking about, serial examinations, respiratory watches, weighing, you know, body weights and, um, you know, monitoring them more frequently. I always say you can give a little bit more, it's harder to take it away. So we're just a little bit more careful about massive fluid bolus or super high rates. We're going to just, you know, titrate and tether and see where we go with things. Exactly. Um, I also uh, just wanted to reiterate, there is no vaccine for cats. There's no good test for cats. So again, you should not be using a dog vaccine in a cat. Um, so again, relatively rare, uh, but it is there. Um, I will also, uh, I see the great question, um, why is lepto not considered a core? Um, to me, it is a core. Um, so I will say, Look at AHA guidelines. You can look, they have um, it's a couple of things that you can fill out to find out lifestyle and look at the lifestyle of the patient. But to me personally, it is a core vaccine. Um, and I treat each pet the way I would if it was my own dog or my own cat. Um, I vaccinate my elderly dog every three years um, or according to rabies law, but he gets an annual lepto. So again, to me, it should be considered core. Awesome. So keep typing in questions. Remember, we both, Justine and I, put in our, our chat. Remember, as a reminder here, uh, in order to get your CE certificate, we'll keep it open for about another 20 minutes. Please make sure you fill out that form so we go ahead and can get you, hopefully within about a week or so, we can go ahead and get your CE certificate, if not within a couple of days. Justine, somebody had a question. Can you describe a little bit more about what it means to have um, you talk about splinting on abdominal palpation. What are you referring to? What are the, what do they do? What do they look like when you do that? 
Yeah, it's super subjective, but as you're palpating the, the renal area or the kidney area near the apaxial region, um, they try to bite or they just look at you or they splint their abdomen where they're tight in their apaxial muscles. Um, some dogs are super tense the whole time. Um, so I always keep my hands there and apply that pressure until they relax a little bit. But that's generally what I mean by splinting their abdomen. Um, so again, to me, just a classic sign of my kidney, kidneys are pissed off and they're painful. As for, as for signs in humans, I would defer to your human MD or go to the CDC website. Um, I remember when I was hiking in St. Kitts to go see this bat cave with a vet student um, from Ross. He was like, oh, I should have brought some Band-Aids. This is uh, one of the streams with the most lepto. I was like, what? <laughs> so remember, um, we do want to be really cognizant. It's usually ADR, sometimes azotemia, sometimes hepatopathy. Um, so again, just be cognizant. Uh, when in doubt, uh, refer them to a CDC website or general good guideline. Um, and what, and, oh, sorry, one, go I just want to add one of our users, one of our uh, attendees asked for the lepto acronym, and we've done that on some webinars before. And so if you're not familiar with the lepto acronym for clinical signs, L-E-P-T-O, the L stands for liver slash kidney. The E is enzyme elevations. The P is polyuria and polydipsia. The T is thrombocytopenia. And the O is oliguria. And so that is something that somebody asked. I forget exactly who, but the acronym for lepto for, for clinical signs and some findings that many people do enjoy thinking about about the disease. Yes. And I believe it was Dr. Natalie Marks who talked about that before. So you can je definitely check out a, uh, one of the Vecro webinars for that or a YouTube live on that. It's also um, in our uh, um, Q quarterly two 2022 uh, Vecral e newsletter. So if you're not familiar, every quarter Vecral puts out a newsletter. Uh, uh, it's a big PDF book guide that we have summaries of our webinars, important things that are coming up. So make sure on our website you check out our newsletters. It's a great way to read some cool stuff that we have done and get some good clinical tips. But this is in our uh, Q2 of 2020 newsletter, and that Lepto article with the acronym is in there as well. Awesome. I do uh, see another question. When using Doxy, do you also use another antibiotic in the same patient? Um, no, I don't. Um, I usually um, will start them on an injectable penicillin, and I don't care what you use, a penicillin, ampicillin, ampicillin sulbactam. Um, if they're sick, I want them on IV um, or, or uh, enteral ch a parenteral choice. Once they're eating and feeling better, I wean them onto doxycycline. So again, I don't usually do two in the hospital and I don't usually do injectable doxycycline because it's like way too high maintenance. <laughs> so again, I usually reach for penicillin. Just be aware, enrofloxacin does not cover lepto well. Um, so make sure you're using an appropriate antimicrobial therapy, um, appropriate for leptospirosis and your staff are using appropriate PPE and taking care of themselves. All right. With that, again, I just want to give a huge shout out to Merck Animal Health for always being so supportive of Vectral CE. Uh, they've been uh, with us from the beginning and love doing uh, webinars and, and YouTube live events for them. So the next time you see your Merck rep, please make sure to thank them. And again, just want to give a huge shout out to you guys. Uh, two and a half years post COVID, post curbside with everything that's going on in life, man, it's been hard and we often don't get thanked enough. Um, so thank you guys for all that you do and always wanting to continue to learn and uh, we will hopefully see you at the next Vet Girl webinar or the next uh, YouTube live again event. Don't forget to fill out that form. Um, it's going to close shortly in about 20 minutes. And for Vet Girl Elite members, they can always go back and, and watch it on our website later. But if you guys want free CE uh, for half an hour, you definitely need to fill that out right away. And uh, for those of you guys who aren't sure and you're like, eh, should I go to Minnesota in uh, you know six weeks uh, for the Vecral U conference? If you've never been to one, they are amazing. You're going to get incredible uh, swag, incredible backpacks, incredible water bottles. All your meals are covered. Free trip to uh, the Mall of America um, Sea Gala. Um, we're going to have a, a gala at the uh, Sea Life Aquarium there. Plus, I timed it with the Minnesota State Fair, which is like the number one only thing you should do in Minnesota for the best people watching ever. And so we really hope to see you there in person. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.